A very emotional President Bush addressing reporters there. We just saw a number of live events with the president. He was talking to reporters just after he had a conference call with Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki, both of New York City and of the state of New York. The, the president, before uh, getting what appeared to be very choked up, talking, uh, repeating a lot of statements that he said over the last couple days, once again reiterating that he considers this an act of war, this act on America, saying there is no safe harbor for the terrorists who have carried this out, nor f no safe harbor for the countries that could be supporting or harboring the terrorists. And he talked of support coming from other countries around the world, uh, mentioning Russia, Saudi Arabia, and also, I think, making allusion to Jordan as well. Um, let's bring in our Kelly Wallace, who we were talking with before we went ahead and listened to this conference call and also we're listening to the talk with reporters. Kelly, question for you. One of the reporters was asking a lot about the Pakistani government and the level of support. If, if our viewers were with us earlier today, you saw leaders of Pakistan come out and hold a news conference and make a statement. Why is there a question at this point how much support the government of Pakistan is offering and why is it important to America to have that support? Well, it's important, Darren, because Pakistan and then it's just the United Arab Emirates and also Saudi Arabia, only the three countries that recognize the Taliban as the ruling government of Afghanistan. Pakistan viewed as really the closest ally to Afghanistan. And obviously, the president in that news conference saying that he will not talk about any intelligence matters, will not talk about the investigation. Privately, though, U.S. officials saying that the evidence is uh, definitely starting to point to the network of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is believed to be in Afghanistan, and it is believed that the Taliban has been providing Osama bin Laden safe haven. So when you have Pakistan, General Musharraf, the military ruler of Pakistan, coming out, making a statement, saying that Pakistan stands united with the U.S. government in combating terrorism, if that is true, and as you heard the president, he obviously uh, seemed gratified by that statement, although a little skeptical, of course, wanting to see exactly what the general means by what he says. But if that is true, and if the Pakistani government will stand with the U.S. and this sort of international coalition that this White House is trying to build, that would be significant because, again, a lot of ifs here, Darren, but if it is determined that the network of Osama bin Laden is involved, if it is determined that the Taliban has been providing safe haven to Osama bin Laden, then certainly Afghanistan more isolated than before if the Pakistanis step with the U.S. and the world community <coughs> and not with Afghanistan. And Kelly, it sounds like the president once again uh, saying, stating what he's been saying all along to the world to the countries of the world, either you're with the U.S. or you're against the U.S., and if you're against the U.S., well, good luck to you. Exactly, Darren. You know, we have been talking about sort of the, the U.S. really trying to build this international coalition. You heard the president. He said uh, this is an act of war that has been declared on the U.S. He called this the first war of the 21st century. And he said he is fully confident, based on his conversations, as you noted, with the leaders of Russia and China and Europe and Canada, he is fully confident, he said, that there will be universal support for any action the U.S. takes. But he also said, Darren, you saw that, he said through this time of of great sadness and he said no doubt this nation is tremendously saddened he said he sees this as an opportunity to go out and try and wipe out terrorism to try and hunt it down and we really have been getting the sense from u.s leaders that not only is this administration trying to aid determine who happens to be responsible for these attacks and and to try and take those people out but b to make sure this doesn't happen again and to use this as an opportunity to try and destroy any other terrorist cells that might exist around the world darren kelly wallace at the white White House. Kelly, thank you very much. And as we toss it over to Leon, actually, we're going to go to Boston. This is former President Bush. He is addressing the Lotus Corporation. Let's go ahead and listen to former President Bush. And we've got to be tolerant. If, as the preliminary evidence suggests, this was an act of bin Laden or some related group, or perhaps an entirely different group of radicals, we should be mindful that these were not the acts of all Muslims who, like Christians and Jews, believe in a God of love and mercy. Rather, these were senseless murders uh, committed by religious extremists who kill out of hate. Uh, I, just since I've been back, since yesterday afternoon, have received letters from high officials in Saudi Arabia and talked <coughs> talk to a friend in, in Kuwait. Uh, messages from China. Uh, and this is just here. Certainly the White House has been inundated 
with such messages of concern and support. Uh, and finally, I've seen some of the commentary comparing this attack with Pearl Harbor. I'm probably the only guy in this room old enough to remember where I was when Pearl Harbor, when the first reports of Pearl Harbor came in. Uh, and in some respects, there are similarities. For example, just as Pearl Harbor awakened this country from the notion that we could somehow avoid the call to duty and defend freedom in, in Europe and Asia in World War II, so too should this most recent surprise attack erase the concept in some quarters that America can somehow go it alone uh, in the fight against terrorism or in anything else for that matter. But in many respects, this is far more difficult. It is far more difficult to fight an enemy uh, who refuses to show his face. Uh, and so earlier this week, we were confronted head on once again by one of the remaining great challenges of our post-war post -war, war world, uh, the threat of terrorism. I remember when President Reagan asked me when I was Vice President to head up a task force on international terrorism. Uh, we made some good recommendations, uh, but clearly those recommendations couldn't solve the problems that our President and our country face today. Uh, I can tell you I talk quite regularly to our son. have been doing that since he was a little kid uh, and, and will continue to do it, but it's not always about policy. It's not. It's not, what do you think, Dad, I should be doing that kind of thing. It is more the relationship of a cl very close family uh, staying in touch one with the other. Matter of fact, all, all three of his brothers and his sister called me in our little, little uh, um, hotel out there in Wisconsin yesterday, just staying in touch one with the other. His families all across this country are doing. Uh, I think I know uh, that George is strong. Uh, I know that he has a fantastic national security team around him. I know that in reaching out to the Congress, as we're seeing now, and in reaching out to our friends and allies and others around the world, he is doing the right thing. Uh, I've got to confess to being a little annoyed at the attacks on him for following security procedures, uh, not rushing right back to Washington. But as you've seen in today's paper, there was some credible uh, uh, threats on the life of the president indeed on the White House itself. And so, and, and several people have called to apologize uh, for their premature judgments on that. Uh, he does know what he's doing. Uh, he's blessed with this strong team. And I think he's lifted by the prayers of the American people and the prayers of people around the world. And so, I, I ask you to keep our president and the victims in their prayers in your prayers, uh, pray for the families, pray for that we will prevail uh, against this threat. We've moved into a different era now. Uh, you saw what NATO did yesterday, and I think that is very, very important, that the alliance stood, is standing firmly with the United States. You're hearing, the President has heard from Jiang Zemin in China and from Putin in Russia. And I think this is very important, all denouncing the international terror. So a coalition is kind of in the process of coming together, uh, and then it'll be the awesome responsibility of the president and his national security team to determine what to do. Uh, the prospects of peace and prosperity in our country, this notwithstanding, have really uh, never been higher. Uh, and yet the world does remain a dangerous place with more instability and unpredictability. People used to ask me when I was still present, well, is the Soviet Union having imploded? Who's the enemy? Why do we need a strong defense? Why do we need all this intelligence? Who's the enemy? And I'd say way back then, I've continued to say the enemy is unpredictability and of course instability. Uh, and I think we see the unpredictable nature of the threat uh, just in the, we've seen it just in the last few days. The Soviet bear, the, um, the uh, great superpower is gone, but new dangers have emerged to take this, this take its place, take the place of, of a kind of superpower confrontation. Uh, regional tensions in Europe and the subcontinent remain. Narco traffickers still threaten your kids and my grandkids. Uh, rogue states such as Iraq and North Korea 
unpredictable, uh, but I think presenting still present a very clear threat to to civilized countries in a lot of way. And together with terrorism, all represent, represent threats to the peaceful world that we seek to build. And if I may, might add, all of this and more should reinforce the need for Americans to have the best possible intelligence in the world. You may remember I went to CIA. I was living peacefully in China as the equivalent of your ambassador. I was then uh, head of the liaison office with the title of ambassador because I'd been ambassador at the United Nations. And um, we were bicycling away happily there in China. Uh, in those days, China was isolated, uh, isolated from the rest of the world, and so we couldn't do uh, see, go into anybody's home. We couldn't be received by many other officials. And I remember bicycling one Sunday uh, back from our little church service in Beijing to the U.S. liaison office, and a messenger came from our embassy or our liaison office and said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we have a message, important message for you. I said, uh, he said, you better be sitting down. I said, I am sitting down, right on my bicycle, right here. He said, no, no, this is important. So anyway, it was a, a request from President Ford that I come back to head the CIA. Uh, I had not, I'd been a consumer of intelligence at the United Nations. I'd known something about it as a congressman, uh, but I had not, uh, I didn't know the, all the technicalities of intelligence. But I went to CIA at a time when CIA had been criticized for properly for some things, but, in, but, but uh, unfairly attacked for many things uh, that it shouldn't have been attacked for. And what happened out of that period was that many of our human intelligence sources dried up. If they see there's some, some uh, muckraker going out to CIA and considering that everybody out there is, is uh, doing something bad or naughty, and if they see the names of, of our intelligence sources released, those sources dry up. And so human intelligence is a kind of a dirty business. And in it, you have to deal with unsavory people. Uh, people tried to make a lot out of the fact that at one point the intelligence community dealt with Manuel Noriega. Well, they did, but it isn't a nice, clean business. And if you're going to infiltrate some cell somewhere, or a terrorist cell, you have to deal with people that are willing to betray their country, people that are willing to betray their friends, people that want money or other things. And it's not pleasant. But if we are going to provide the president with the best possible intelligence, uh, we have to have uh, the we have to free up the intelligence system from some of its constraints. You got to always respect. Uh, the privacy and right of an American citizen. Uh, but I think, I think they ought to take a hard look now at whether we've gone too far in denying the people that run the intelligence community uh, access to human intelligence. You know, you can tell a lot from science. When I was president during the Gulf War, they could tell me exactly how many troops were where on, on the front lines. They could say which direction they were moving. I remember getting a thing from Saddam Hussein uh, via Gorbachev saying, well, they're pulling out. Yeah, they're pulling out of where they were, but they were going south towards Saudi Arabia. And we could tell that from intelligence. But what we couldn't tell is the intent. And the only way you can measure intent in intelligence is if you, if you have human intelligence, if you have people that are really willing to risk their lives for a cause, and sometimes they'll risk it for noble reasons, they believe in democracy and freedom, and sometimes they risk it for uh, more selfish reasons like money or women, or you name it. And uh, it's, it's not pleasant, but I think we're going to find that we, we have to do more in the way of human intelligence, and that means we're going to have to take a broad look at exactly what constraints the intelligence community, not just CIA, but the community itself, is operating under. And I think, you're, I think it's important to recognize that all this new internet technology that you guys know so much about has to be reviewed, in a sense, to see whether we're constraining our intelligence communities from, from uh, getting after the culprits that may be American citizens. It's not pleasant, but I believe strongly we need to strengthen our, our intelligence. We got the best intelligence system in the world. 
Our president gets better intelligence, I think, than the Prime Minister of England, President of Israel, Prime